Hello everyone, it's Maggie with Minds on Mushrooms where we're unveiling the magic behind psychedelics for mental health and addiction. Mm -hmm. Today, I am so honored to have with us Magdalena Grace. She, you are the head of a foundation called Lotus Thorn, oh, Throne, <laughs> Lotus Throne. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me today. You are coming in from San Diego, California, correct? That is correct, yes. And how's the summer going for you? It's amazing. I have to just, true funny story. Like when you said Lotus Thorn yesterday, <laughs> at the time of this recording, yesterday was the Feast of Mary Magdalene. And I actually, um, she's she's taught me a lot about the the, the rose lineage as a, the divine feminine that's happening right now. And so I actually had the women hold roses and, and put their fingers into the thorns to, oh, wow. <laughs> to remind us that, you know, every rose has a thorn. You can't have a rose without thorns. In fact, it's part of the deal. So it, it's a great kind of segue to what we, you know, our mission and things with the Lotus throne um yes. but I'll, never, I'll never forget that little little um shift <laughs> um yeah so let's get to that let's discuss kind of the mission behind lotus throne <laughs> if you will yeah absolutely and it goes so well and i know you and i connected on this and it's a big reason why we're talking um the mission is to ultimately open up the stigma, have conversations and help people break the generational cycles of addiction and suicide, um, you know, be the change we want to see in the world, um, not just in the healing world, but the world, because uh, I know my own journey with addiction and suicide and, and so much unprocessed grief and trauma, you know, there's a lot of people that'll talk about high blood pressure, cholesterol, like it's, you know, diabetes, like it's kind of like a normal thing, even cancer, you know, it's not, none of those things are fun, right? Um, right. We, admit, we admit that, but they're so much easier to focus on and talk about. Whereas, you know, you're talking about suicide, addiction has been demonized and there's so much trauma underneath all of that. And with my own journey of wanting to die and almost going down the same path, my brother who was an alcoholic, you know, I, I know the pain and the shame and the guilt. And a lot of times, you know, when people are left behind, like I was so many times, you just, you feel so much of that, inability to heal and just to go through life becomes so much harder. So again, bringing it full circle just to, to break those cycles of addiction and suicide and opening up that conversation so that, you know, we can give hope and healing to those who are, you know, still with us and or grieving and or struggling with addiction still. Sure. Um, I'd just like to ask each guest on the show, um, and I know it can be a mouthful, um, but I'd really like to hear kind of your path and your journey um, to this space. And, you know, I think I was reading, you do have a background in coaching. Um, and yeah, I'd like to kind of hear how your personal journey slash career paths kind of got you to where you are. Um, and any significant stories, of course, please include. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I'm born and raised in the Midwest and uh, my family was, you know, very German, very Dutch of origin. And there was a lot of, um, how do you say this, like sweeping under the rug of conversations about our shadows as a family, our shadows as humans, you know, we just want to be in the light and focus on the positive all the time. And so I, I became that kind of a person who being raised by a single father, an alcoholic older brother. My mom was schizophrenic. So there was, she had tried to commit suicide multiple times. So in a small, small rural community in Iowa, that that's a lot, like a lot of pain and a lot of stuff that you, they just didn't have the tools mm -hmm. to really properly support. They, they, you know, my dad did the best he could. I've healed a lot of my relationship with him um, through this process. Um, but there's just a lot of abandonment and through that abandonment and witnessing what my brother went through, I always thought, you know what? I got to be the good girl. I can't make waves. I go to church every Sunday. I get straight A's. I became a perfectionist and a very critical, hard on myself 
perfectionist. So everything I try to do, I overdid. Mm. <laughs> everything I consumed, I overconsumed. So you can start to see kind of these patterns. I didn't know at the time it was coming from a deep, deep sense of abandonment. I discovered through plant medicine in the you know past few years that that was my core wound. Okay. And I was running from fear and, uh, you know, not grounded and, and became a binge drinking workaholic by the time mm -hmm. 2020 hit, I wanted to die. I had eight friends who committed suicide. I actually oh started God. thinking, you know, I actually, even though that was really brutal, I actually started rationalizing, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, because life is hard. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look outside yourself for your answers, which most of us have been programmed to do through religion, school, institutions, and even me, you alluded to this, I was in health and fitness for 17 years as a personal trainer, a health coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I coached over 10,000 people on daily ah. habits <laughs> and how to be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> However, that, that didn't stop me from self-sabotage and from, you know, just, just you know, white knuckling it mm -hmm. through life. And wow. being, being a mom and a wife was also hard. That brought up a lot of my own childhood trauma unbeknownst to me um, in my 30s because I didn't have a mom and okay. I didn't I didn't have like a mother father like you know Archie Bunker or whatever um, that's not the right example but you, you know like the, the white the picket family. fence family right. yeah yeah mm -hmm. and so I struggled with you know feeling like a worthless mom all of these emotions and feelings that I had to just suppress my whole life they just mm -hmm. came whew, blaring to the surface and I hit rock bottom in 2020 after my brother died of alcoholism. Actually, that was like a wake up call for me because I was basically starting to go down that path myself. Mm -hmm. And I realized I have a family. I know I'm here for a purpose. I feel like I'm not in alignment with that purpose. And so I, I had a mentor come to me. He was channeling a message from the divine, from God, source, creator, whatever, whatever you believe in. And he said, you're supposed to heal. You're going to be a spiritual teacher and essentially a medicine woman. I, he didn't say that at that time, but a, but a healer. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was a sales coach making boatloads of money, but, you know, feeling miserable inside. And so it didn't quite equate, but at the same time, I knew he was right. Like my heart, something in my soul said, listen to this guy, even though you barely know him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did. And in a very short order, you know, the next two years, um, I went and dove deep into the, the deep end of the pool of plant medicine, psilocybin, psilocybin, ayahuasca, a lot of breath work, a lot of um, shadow work. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know what shadow work was um, until, you know, I just happened to meet some of the right people along the path and yes. started realizing I can't, you know, drink, work over, social media over distract my distractions and medicate my medications anymore. I got to go inside yeah. where mm -hmm. all the answers are. And so through all of those mediums and a whole lot more, I, I could probably talk for hours on this. <laughs> I was able to come out of that and remember who I truly am mm -hmm. at the core of my being. Remember my passion in many lifetimes, having been a healer, a witch, a medicine woman and healing a lot of those wounds and, and even changing my name to, to Magdalena Grace. That mm -hmm. was my chosen spiritual name to then embody that truth in a different way and to go out to the world and, and share what I've learned um, on top of my 17 years in health and fitness. I really work with the mind, the body and the spirit mm -hmm. and serving plant medicine and also working with people without it because it's, it's not for everyone. Right. Um, but to be able to be a facilitator of their healing and and get them through grief recovery, addiction recovery, and spiritual awakening, those are kind of like our focuses. Me and my my husband happen to go on the path with me. Right. Yes. And we can talk about him. I was doing a little reading. Um, I just want to backtrack a little. Um, well, first of all, I'm obsessed with your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maggie, Magdalena. <laughs> um, no, it's beautiful. I wanted to ask you um, in regards to, I mean, I can relate. So the whole reason I am here where I am um, is probably due to my drinking and alcohol abuse. Um, I was able to microdose and realize that alcohol was not for me <laughs> and um, continue to be alcohol free to this day. 
when you were struggling with alcohol, um, did you turn to the medicine to quit or um, do you mind sharing kind of that path? hundred percent. Yeah. Cause I, I, I respect all paths first. I want to, you know, say that. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we're still on the path and, you know, I'm always just tuning in with my alignment and my wise and healed ancestors to make sure, you know, I'm in the right space. Cause I, I'm a, we're big into ancestral trauma. We, we believe and teach that we choose our bodies. We choose our family of origins. We, we choose our karma, which then can become our Dharma. And so my Dharma teaching from my karmic lessons and soul contracts that I've been healing and, you know, unpacking these past three years, um, I wanted to heal the relationship with alcohol as opposed to simply quitting. So, okay. so part of it, um, I choose to still enjoy alcohol. It's a spirit to me. My ancestors utilized it to have a spiritual sacred relationship in an altered mm. state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I needed though, to really understand why and, and why was I challenged by this? Why did my brother die of mm -hmm. alcoholism? And so through many ceremonies and a lot of shadow work and then communing with my wise and healed ancestors, I can explain more of that later if, if you want me to, but the main idea was they showed me where the alcoholism journey started. Okay. So under the medicine and with my husband's help, because he he talks to the dead, he talks to the ancestors, and he wow. was there to help co-facilitate this as well. Mm -hmm. I was able to find the origin story, okay. and it was very different than I anticipated. My brother was there. We had a lifetime back then. Mm. And for us, a lot of what happened was the Christian conversion coming into Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, they forced people to abandon their faith abandon their belief system, okay. abandon their country, abandon mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. to go. And all of a sudden, um, you know, it's like maybe not a good example, but if it's like all of a sudden a Republican comes into a Democrat and says, you have to be a Republican now or you're going to die. Right. You know, kind of intense, yeah. a, little, a little intrusive. I'm being yeah. a smart ass right now, but... <laughs> At the end of the day, so what happened was what the medicine showed me and my husband confirmed was that me and my brother, we were there to go and warn the villages like, hey, the Christians are coming. They have fire. They're forcing. It's it's feast or famine, die, whatever, if you don't convert. And it was in this village where my ancestors were all about music, fun, laughter, mm. and, and just having a good time, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't drink to escape per se. Mm -hmm. they, they drank to enjoy and, and have the spirit within them to have community. Okay. And so they drank mead, and I can talk about that for hours too, but I won't go there. Um, but it's a sacred divine feminine elixir. And so they celebrated each other. Of course, they're still looking at the possibility of what was about to come, but they still were in the moment and had a lot of love for each other. And so they drank, they went to bed, they didn't wake up when the Christians came and showed up and there was people that died. There was wow. homes that were burned and they were forced to abandon their truth. Mm -hmm. And when I told you my core wound was abandonment, I wanted to understand it at the deepest level because I was in the health and fitness industry. A lot of people will quit sugar Mm -hmm. Or they'll quit, they'll do the keto diet or they'll do this thing and think, oh, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But if they don't understand why, they're just going to transfer this thing to that thing. You know, like right. instead of drinking alcohol, I'm going to go have like sugar or or social media or whatever to like kind of numb and escape. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was the path that I chose um, and to be able to understand it at the deepest soul, karmic mm -hmm level okay to see it differently so you were able through ceremony and those experiences really understand the core wound which relating back generationally was that was that is so remarkable <laughs> um question <laughs> and i know you're working with your husband who he is a shaman correct yeah, we're wow. always sensitive to using that word yeah, because okay. it's there's a lot of showmen out there. There's a lot of shamanic practitioners who get a certificate, but he's actually blood 
four tribes in Africa. His grandfather was a shaman. They called him something else, but again, words I know are kind of a big deal. So I'm very sensitive to using words. So we don't necessarily always call him a shaman. It depends on the situation, but he is shaman just to remind people what it actually means is he without medicine can close his eyes and go into other realms and communicate with the dead, uh, remove blockages. He removed some curses from me that were ancestral contracts okay. and things of that nature. And he does that, you know, with or without medicine. And so it, it helps us when we work with people, especially with addiction recovery, because, you know, we just want to make sure that people get to the core of their wound. And then yeah. I, come in, I come in and I do the shadow work because just, just by hearing the truth of my origin story with alcoholism and abandonment doesn't mean that all of a sudden I can right. see light and I was enlightened and I didn't want to drink alcohol anymore. And, you know, it, it wasn't that easy. Right. <laughs> I had to go then and go deep in my pain and suffering and look at the abandonment wound. Shadow work is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult and it takes a lot of courage and bravery. Mm -hmm. But in order for me to, again, heal that relationship with alcohol, which was just simply healing the relationship with myself and my past lives and yeah. my contracts, that was where, for me, the true medicine was to, like, dissolve. And we believe, like, once you really feel something and you name it, then you can heal it. It, it radically shifts your central nervous system and your DNA and your cellular level. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden... You know, I might, instead of me looking at alcohol saying, I'm going to escape unconsciously, right? I'm going to, I'm going to look at it. I'm going to say, I want to enjoy the sacred beverage, commune with my ancestors, connect at the heart level mm -hmm. and, and, and have fun, but not escape. So, right. so that was, that was very unique and, and very complex, but, um, <laughs> But I knew that this this addiction cycle had to end with me because I did not want my kids to go through it. Mm -hmm. And without, we believe in teach, and this is what we've discovered personally and with lots of clients now, until you get to that core and start to dissolve it and dissipate it, you know, you're just going to pass it on to your your children or, or the collective because this is a collective problem. It's not just mm -hmm. our ancestors. Absolutely. Well, I... You, amazing work um, for you. Um, I guess I want to talk about some of your ceremony offerings. Um, I have a girlfriend who was just beyond, um, she she participated in one of your ceremonies, um, Silawaska, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I am so intrigued by this. Can you talk to us about, uh, it's a combination ayahuasca and psilocybin. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk to, yeah, tell me about how that came together. And if you would kind of go into detail, maybe about what a ceremony might entail would be wonderful. I'll give you context. I found psilocybin, or when I discovered it, it was actually went by the term MA, M-A, okay. which is just okay. an acronym, mushrooms and ayahuasca. Oh, um, I prefer to call it Silawaska because then you really know what it is and Ma can be a little confusing. So just <laughs> gotcha. a little backstory there. But yeah. I sat over 50 times um, in a roughly a two-ish year period, first for my own healing, okay. second to train to become a medicine woman mm. and have a deep, deep relationship with the medicines that I'm serving as opposed to, you know, there are options to get a certification Personally, I wouldn't sit with someone who is only certified and didn't have like a deep, deep, long standing, like multiple ceremony experience. But that's just me. And that's what the path that I chose. And so through my mentors, through my teachers, all of them served Silawaska with a couple of exceptions. Wow. So it, it, it found me. It called me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a natural fit for when me and my husband decided to, to walk this path in survey medicine for us to serve that. So just give you the context of that. Sure. So yes, it is a, a microdose of Aya vine. So it's not the full Monte ayahuasca. Okay. Uh, the Aya vine is actually a simple, the vine, it's herb. It's an herbal tincture, really. It's actually legal. I, I coach people in microdosing with it. And it's a very embodied heart opening mm. medicine. Okay. 
And so we do that first to again, open the heart. And then we call her grandmother, Aya. She's, she's there to work with the psilocybin to help you go deeper. Okay. And oftentimes, um, if you know anything about Aya, she can also bring up a little bit of the, the shadows. I mean, psilocybin can too. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have found that they anchor each other really, Mm -hmm. really Wow. And when you serve the, the psilocybin, then again, that, that dose is individual. There's no one size fits all, quote unquote, prescriptive mm-hmm. model. It's more intuitive and, and we support, you know, the person and meet them where they're at because um, okay. you don't want to overdose. And anyway, all of those things <laughs> have been part of our training and part of our safety, you know, first to ensure that people have a, a great experience. And so we, we usually have an overnight ceremony. Sometimes okay. we even do two day ceremonies like we're going to be doing in uh, Minnesota this fall as part of a eight week shamanic initiation program. We don't mm. just do the ceremony. We offer up a container. It's usually six to eight weeks okay. of shadow work to start then the 24 or 48 hour experience. And included in that is a lot of stuff. You know, okay. we get into yeah. the ancestral shadows. We get into breath work, Kundalini yoga, we do a lot of integration and meditation um, and through all that, you know, where you help them ground and, and make sense, uh, make whole and complete of what messages are shared with them, both at the event in person and then weeks for weeks after we support 30 days after because the medicine ceremony is only 10 percent of oh, the success okay. of what we do. Wow. Um, that's the biggest misconception out there. You see all these people, ah, I'm going to go to Peru and I'm going to, mm. I'm going to stay with ayahuasca and I'm just going to come back. And all of a sudden my life is going to be better. And I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. It's, it's <laughs> bullshit. It's, it's not the rest of the story that mm-hmm. you've got to really be mindful of preparation and taking it seriously. So we recommend people prepare at least four weeks in advance. Mm-hmm physically, spiritually, emotionally, as well as with uh, the food and nutrition protocols. Mm -hmm. So we provide all of that. Then you have the ceremony and then the the support after. So that's also a teachable moment. I just am really wanting to to make sure people know that it takes a lot more work than you realize. The medicine Mm -hmm. can only do so much. The rest is up to you. Yes. um, That is so, so true. And um, I was curious, do you, for the most part, offer the psilocybin or are you kind of doing psilocybin ceremonies or is it mainly the combo? It's a great question. Um, So for first timers, we're really, really sensitive to, you know, how much is too much. And so we'll ask them, we'll have a a conversation and offer them the psilocybin and we may just do the psilocybin. We just had that with a client who actually had a, a pretty big um, drug addiction and alcohol addiction path in history. So he was really, really scared to come mm-hmm. in and do plant medicine and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who get addicted and escape through plant medicine. I've seen that too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we reassured him, you know what, we're just going to do, um, we're going to work with psilocybin only. We're not going to have the other medicine. We wanted to meet him where he was at based on his history. And we do that with a lot of people who struggle with addiction pass. And if they're open to it, we still case by case basis, will offer up the psilocybin every time, but we, we, we first just check in with their sure. comfort level of all of that. Gotcha. Um, I was also reading, you do a lot of work with relationship or couples. Um, let's talk about that. That's kind of a newer idea to me, but I often think about um, after my failed marriage, uh, you know, what if I or we would have found uh, the medicine or psilocybin is what I'm talking about sooner, um, just because it's just offers such a shift on perspective. And again, versus running to mask with a glass of wine, you know, facing difficult conversations or situations. Um, Yeah. So I want to hear all about it. (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And that's what happened for us. Cause I, at the time I hit rock bottom, I was wrestling with the idea of divorce and Mm. just not being married anymore. And so, cause we both, me and my partner, he became someone he wasn't, I became someone I wasn't. 
And we actually discovered that it was part of our karmic contract. Our ancestors showed, no, this is you. You chose this path of pain and suffering so you could heal it, transmute it, and then teach about it. Mm. So all of that came through not only the medicine work, again, shadow work and having other spiritual teachers. It was a combo of so many things. But mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it, it helped us because we did three couples ceremonies. Okay which we now offer. So it was just me and him. Mm -hmm. um, and like the first one was huge because he's been divorced. He's had really, really painful. I'll just keep it simple. <laughs> painful mm -hmm. <laughs> past relationships. And what do we do? We take those past relationships with us. I had a deep, deep father wound mm. and, you know, a lot of masculinity wounds. I took that with me into the marriage and you marry your wounds and if you don't understand that, you know, if you're not only doing this, you may separate and move on. And guess what? You're just going to attract someone with the same wounds. And I'm not saying that for everyone. And mm -hmm. trust me, I'm a big fan of divorce and separation and all of it. I feel like it, 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 there comes a time and a place if both partners aren't doing the work. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. You can't make someone change. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started the path. I begged him to come in with me. And thankfully... He did. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we started doing the couples ceremonies. But then we also had coaches, mentors and other things along the way to help us process and integrate. We still had a marriage and family therapist. Mm. Um, but as we, we grew together, you know, as opposed to apart, and trust me, there's times where this still happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every time you pull back another layer of the onion, guess what? Um, right. more, more stuff comes up, but we're both very committed to, mm -hmm. to the work. And so we, we saw how much it helped us. And so mm -hmm. of course we wanted to help others and be able to support them. So similarly with a couple, um, we, we give them an eight week program okay. to you know, both figure. And it's all about the individual. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still about what are you coming in, ma'am, sir, or if it's a you know gay couple, doesn't matter. The two individuals are coming in as their own souls, mm -hmm. doing their own work. But then we bring them together to unpack what did they heal? What did they learn about their personal soul's journey? And how does that play out in their marriage? You know, the, the good, the bad, and the shadowy, mm -hmm. as we call it. Mm -hmm. How can you integrate that? and change habits slowly over time. Um, so we would, in a perfect world, you know, do like two or three ceremonies with the same couple over the course of a year sure. or two and have given them other tools and ongoing support. We actually just served a divorced couple. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> I also serve combo frog medicine. And, you know, they, they may be divorced, but they have kids together. Okay. And, you know, a lot of times right. divorced, can really cause a lot of pain for the children and it can also be another ancestral curse so they like came in divorced but united to heal together mm. and so that was really touching for us and serving combo frog medicine is actually my favorite medicine to serve we don't have to talk about that necessarily but it's it's very cleansing and it's, mm -hmm. it's still very psycho spiritual it's not a psychedelic it's it's a frog animal medicine still from the jungle but to be able to cleanse your body and open and clear your chakras and to have this experience together that was that was pretty profound to witness for them oh yes i have yet to try combo or have combo. Um, but I do know how powerful it is. I was at a retreat and um, those who chose to be served, I think had a much deeper experience. So <laughs> something to think about. Um, I'm a little scared of frog face. It's I a know thing. it's a thing. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but I hear it's kind of like the world's best Botox or something. <laughs> I don't know. It seems to be not so pretty at first, but ends beautifully, I guess. 100%. Yep. Um, I'm for sure. All right. Uh, let's see here. I was wanting to talk about, would you be open to kind of sharing kind of how you currently yourself work and practice with the medicine? Are you someone who's still, um, you know, do you have kind of a yearly plan of ceremonies? I like just to talk to someone who's so experienced um, 
and how, what that looks like for you to kind of keep up with your journey and with, yeah, the work. Yeah. And that's beautiful. And and what I can tell you, the medicine, it's kind of, it's not the same as maybe planning a health and fitness protocol, right? Um, it's, it's once you have, and this is my experience and my husband as well, once you have a deep, deep relationship with the medicine, um, you're not required to, to sit with it nearly as much again personal decision and i also am very intuitive with it i'm not going to say you know what i'm not going to sit for the next six months right now right i don't know what's going to happen i don't know when the medicine's going to call me back um i will say this i microdosed for 18 months straight Mm. and then the medicine said you're done yeah (laughs) now i have zero interest in microdosing. And now I'm working with sacred oils as another tool mm. that I meditate with every day instead of microdosing. Oh, wow. I've been okay. ayahuasca. Um, I do have a deep relationship with grandfather Hape. Hape mm. is a very, very powerful medicine that we also serve. It's optional, but we serve it inside of our ceremonies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I work with that five days a week, still, still says that I'm in alignment to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, And if I feel the call, like this week, full disclosure, I am going to go and sit by myself and have a communion with the psilocybin Okay. to just have like a tune up because I just went through a lot of serving and a lot of being with others while serving the medicine. So this is my opportunity to do it. And I I heeded the call and it was time. Mm -hmm. I don't turn to medicine like, you know, someone might go get acupuncture once a month or chiropractic. Mm -hmm month. I don't need to, because, um, you also got to be careful. I have seen people do way too much medicine. Um, I was even on that path myself because I didn't know any better. Like I was doing way too much and it dysregulated my central nervous system. Oh wow! So I also encourage people just be really, really careful. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you just got to tune in and, and make sure your body can handle it. Yeah, um, and yeah. make sure your nutrition, your gut health, everything, get your regular doctor checkups, you know, medicine is, is, doesn't have to be utilized as often as you might think, as long as you're doing the other things to support you, um, you can get a lot from one journey. It could last you a really, really long time, but again, mm-hmm. it's right. very individualized, very personal. And since I did so much in such a short period of time, like yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'll be integrating for the rest of my of my life. And when we when we serve with our clients, much like um, you know the kiranderos and shamans, uh, different teachers, we we do microdose when we serve. Okay. So I get to be in the medicine every month as I serve. So all of those reasons, I don't really have a like a protocol or a plan. It's just whenever the medicine calls me and it's, it's not that often anymore. Yeah. I love that. I uh, can relate. I feel uh, when I first started my journey, kind of like I couldn't get enough (laughs) after, especially the, the, my first kind of mystical, very profound experience was just so beautiful. Um, I was kind of wanting to just get back there. Um, But realize, yeah, at a certain point, um, it, it'll let you know <laughs> if you've had too much or, um, yeah, it's such a personal individual thing. So I appreciate hearing that to know I'm on track. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. What do you have any exciting, uh, things happening in the near future ceremony wise or anything with the foundation that yes. you want to talk about? Thank you. Uh, so upcoming, uh, at the time of this recording, it's July 23rd. So September is Suicide Awareness Month. Um, so that whole month is going to be about um, talking about suicide awareness. And I, I've i mentioned this before, anyone who dies of alcoholism or, or drug overdose, it's, it's a different version mm-hmm. of suicide. So it's kind of like it covers the whole theme of our foundation. Um, so we're going to have an event here in San Diego. Um, it'll be a healing, inspirational speakers. We'll have vendors. We'll have healers, mental health experts, uh, just building awareness and having a healing event. 
um, with a, a fee at the door and then just a lot of value. Um, and then we were coming to Minnesota to the, the weekend of the Day of the Dead, um, since we work with the living and the dead <laughs> in our mm -hmm. business and connecting with um, ancestors around Samhain. If you get into Samhain, also known as around Halloween, we pick that weekend strategically. Okay. Um, even though it, hopefully it's not snowing that weekend when they're there, <laughs> well, you know, whatever will be, will be. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna have a, a big, um, similar, um, but probably even bigger event, um, a private event, but a healing speakers, uh, lots of great things that people can can go and get their own healing, but also be inspired and to share and to give back to our cause ultimately. So those are the two like big events in the fall. And then we, we do have a shamanic initiation program that starts October okay. and we'll have a 48 hour weekend uh, retreat in November. And then it goes for a whole eight weeks for people who are really wanting to remember who they truly are to mm -hmm. transmute as much of that shadow, um, let go of some of the baggage of the ancestors that no longer serves and have more light and more purpose to mm -hmm. really shine their light and live out their purpose much more out loud than they are currently. So that's like, those are like the big things that are coming up for us. Gotcha. Well, I'll be sure to get some details and help promote those that both sound amazing and how fascinating you've got space and venue in San Diego or you're in San Diego and then you've got a venue in Minnesota as well. Um, that's so great. I wanted to kind of just, uh, Let's touch um, on ancestral healing just for a minute, if you don't mind. How much is a participant supposed to maybe know, or do they have to know anything about their ancestors, or they're just coming in? And so uh, many times are people just shocked, or can we talk about maybe some experiences? Or I'm just so fascinated. Um, and learning more. <laughs> and I think that's a path I'm kind of interested in heading down next. Um, so anything you can tell me, maybe to help me <laughs> prepare. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's, 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 again, a little bit situational depending on the person. However, we have helped all of our clients, uh, if they were open, first, they've got to be open. If someone's not into thinking that, you know, ancestral healing is necessary, we don't force it on anyone. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you know, something that you believe is important. And I'll explain why it could be important through a story here in a little bit. Okay. But we've worked with people who were adopted. Okay. We've worked with people who never knew their parents. Like, I'm an mm -hmm. example of that. Like, I never knew my mom. I never knew her side of the family. So in some ways you could almost say I was in somewhat of an adopted situation too, because I knew nothing, at least on the conscious level until I started recognizing that I, and I got a certification, it's a shadow work certification and it, it scientifically talks about, some people talk about epigenetics or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer to stick with ancestral trauma specifically. Mm -hmm. We inherit our blood our bones, our DNA, mm -hmm. who created us, our parents, mm -hmm. whether you knew them or not. You, it has been proven that you had to have 4,000 people involved in the making of you. Mm -hmm. So if great aunt Tilda was an alcoholic, it actually really wasn't the addiction that she inherited. It was the unresolved ancestral trauma. Okay. That's what we've seen. And I'll explain. We also were taught besides my, my, um, Shadow work um, certification helps regress people back to their ancestors without medicine. Okay. And it helps them understand, oh, this limiting belief, I am not enough. Or in my case, this limiting like belief around abandonment that nobody wants me. I am all alone. I am separate. I am less than. That came from my ancestors, right? right. And is that an example of what I shared with you sure. before? Yep. And so... You don't have to know your family per se. You don't have to know their names. Um, you just know what are the repeating patterns, mm -hmm. habits, addictions, we'll call them addictive behaviors, whatever, the things that keep coming up, but you want to repress them. You don't want to look at them. That to me is ancestral trauma. That's mm -hmm. patterns that are in your bones, in your cells that are so deeply wound and unconscious. Carl Jung 
I've studied him. I use one of his books actually as part of my course curriculum. Those are the repressed parts of ourselves that we don't want to look at. Okay. And I believe that a lot of that is not just from this lifetime and your choices. Mm -hmm. It can also be past lives. And some people would argue that past lives and ancestral trauma is, is connected. And I, I'm one of those people that would agree with that. Okay. And so if you have, uh, and what we do in our ceremonies or even virtually without medicine, we have an ancestral lineage and pre imprint, sorry, releasing process. Oh, okay. Where let's say you have a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. And it drives you to make a lot of unhealthy decisions. Like mm -hmm. for me, my drinking was around a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to break up the shame and guilt and release that, that was what my ancestors showed me. I, I chose to be the black sheep in my family to come in mm -hmm. and heal and transmute into love, light, acceptance, peace. And so mm -hmm. as I went through that process, then that's where the true healing could come. But I had to have that conversation with my ancestors in a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Our teacher taught us that process. And now we use that with or without medicine to really, it's going to sound weird, but you're basically saying, thank you, you know, dad and grandma or mm. uncle or Bob, you know, you're saying, thank you for showing me yeah. this yeah. shadow, this pain, this suffering. It's a collective family thing. And usually there's one or two black sheep or outcasts in the family that come through and wave their hand and say, okay, ancestors, I'm here to heal this for everybody. Mm -hmm. So as I was healing, I healed my brother posthumously. As I healed, I'm healing my sisters. As I'm healing, I'm healing my children and I'm creating a new lineage that's focused on the, the love and the light and the respect of the pain and the suffering that our ancestors went through. Mm. You know, especially in Minnesota, like most of my ancestors, you, you were in northern Germany or Norway, your winters were harsh. You didn't know if you were going to live or die. Right. Yeah. Think about that. That's in your blood. That's in mm -hmm. your cells. I'm sorry, no amount of talk therapy is going to help you let that go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I love talk therapy. I still have some of that. And I've worked mm -hmm. with trauma informed coaches and therapists. So I've done it all. Yeah. But the deepest thing that gave me like the biggest, like, thank you, like somatic release mm -hmm. was the ancestral trauma and, and understanding that this is why I'm here. So if, if you're listening to this and you feel like I'm the black sheep, I'm the outcast, nobody <laughs> understands me. I'm at the family reunion and everyone's like looking at me with my tattoos <laughs> going, yeah, she was always a little different. Then guess what? you're probably here <laughs> to, to help heal the, the lineage and let go of the shit that no longer serves you. And, and it's, it's a gift. At first I was like, well, this sucks. Mm. Why did I agree to this again? Right. But, but once you connect with the wise and healed ancestors uh, and we are our ancestors, I believe this, you know, I'm just another iteration of maybe my great, great grandfather or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're coming back to repeat history. Why does history repeat itself? Exactly. So the same freaking souls who are still trying to figure it out, right? right? And we're never now, and this is my last thing, this is like the perfect time with the divine feminine rising and all that's happening mm. on the planet for us. I believe there's a lot of us who, who chose this path to help heal the collective. This isn't just about our ancestors. This isn't just about, you know, my children or my siblings, this is about the collective healing of the planet. Yeah. So we can all let go of the the war and the greed and the patriarchy and all of the stuff that has caused so much, so much pain and suffering for, for millennia. Yes. Wow. That was all so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, I do. I kind of do feel like a black sheep in some sense. Um, and I mean, I guess both, I have a twin brother and um, we kind of for differently, very differently qu quit drinking. Um, he was just able to do that. <laughs> I used the medicine, but I do feel that I am, I am gaining just understanding around the addiction and around why my father's father was the way he was. Um, so I feel like I'm scratching the surface. Um, 
but yeah, I do hope that I am kind of ending um, this generational addiction issue. Um, but yeah, always, it's so fascinating. I want to talk to you more about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just really, really um, admire you and all the work that you have done and all everything that you offer. Um, let's mention your website so people can get, you know, check it out and see what's going on there. Absolutely. So I'll give you two just for simplicity's sake. Um, MagdalenaGrace.com is kind of like my catch-all uh, explains a lot more of, of the whole picture. And then Lotus, it's kind of a mouthful. I, I know I'm, I think about changing it, but right now it is what it is. Lotus Throne Sanctuary. Okay. Dot org. All right. I will be sure to call both out when we post and get this episode out. Um, let's see anything else you want to add or anything else you might have. <sighs> You know, I, I ultimately, you know, no matter how much you're going through right now, just you matter, your your pain and suffering matter. And please don't give up on you. Please stay around on this planet. Um, it always gets me emotional. Aww. Just don't give up on you. Don't don't give up on the work and um, really just embrace, embrace the shadows because they can bring you, you can't have shadows without the light and the more you can shine a light with hopefully support, love and grace and compassion. Don't do it by yourself. Shadow work and medicine work, in my opinion, very strong opinion should not be done by yourself. It's mm -hmm. not a do it yourself thing. It's meant to be done in community. Like our ancestors did. They did it in community. They mushrooms, mead, all of it. And you loved on one another. So find a community that is safe um, doesn't have to be mine, you know, doesn't have to be Maggie's, but, but really just make sure you walk this path with someone that you trust and who's someone who has experience and has walked through their own valley of the shadows to get to where you maybe want to be. So just, just be mindful of, of that. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, I think that you have been so helpful today for so many that are curious and, um, just want to know more information. Um, so thank you for your time. I so appreciate you. I want to have you back. There's endless things to talk about. We're just getting started. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. For more information, please visit mindsonmushrooms.com. Thank you for joining the journey.